Go ahead, David. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I'm honored to be invited to speak uh, in one of these presentations, uh, particularly since I've watched over a hundred of them. And they're essentially the former lectures for the wargaming part of my studies. Uh, one word, word of warning though, I do tend to talk quite quickly and I've got a lot of slides to get through. So I don't know if I'd recommend watching the recording of this presentation at one and a half times speed, which is what I normally do. So just to give you a sense of uh, what I'm going to go through, um, first of all, just give you a, a broad sense of what I'm doing on the PhD um, and if the issues around urban warfare. Uh, then going to talk more about urban wargaming and then look a little bit of detail at some work I did around the battles and the war games of the Battle of Hue from Vietnam. Then talk about the war games that I've been working on uh, over the last year or so. Um, and then towards the end, talk a bit more about civilian populations and some of the challenges of incorporating those within urban war games. Um, and then finally, just very briefly, look at, at Gaza and Ukraine, and Ukraine and how that may be changing some of our, our perceptions. Um, I'll aim to stop sort of about two or three times during the course of the presentation uh, so as to take uh, any questions. Uh, so first of all, a bit about me. Um, I started wargaming over 50 years ago. I'm a Brit, so to me, wargaming is all about playing around with figures. Um, and the two Shire publications, those two little slim volumes were very much our Bible uh, when we started wargaming uh, back in the early 70s. Uh, the first war game I can remember actually making uh, was actually in 1974. Uh, during the summer holidays, uh, Turkey invaded Cyprus about like, July 1974, just at the start of the summer holidays. Um, and I spent the rest of the summer holidays uh, creating a hex encounter war game uh, based around the invasion of Cyprus. Um, I then the, made the mistake for a war game of actually joining the army. Um, I was a Royal Signals officer and in 10 years in the British Army, I didn't hear the word war gaming mentioned once. Um, however, I kept myself busy um, and I became a writer for Traveller and contributed chapters and even a couple of whole books uh, to the fourth edition of Traveller, uh, a couple of which are shown there. Uh, once I got out of uh, the army, uh, I eventually eventually ended up setting up my own company, uh, Dayton Limited, um, focused around the use of virtual reality in immersive spaces and virtual worlds. Um, and the picture there is actually from a training simulation that we did for the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, for training radio systems managers uh, in disaster management situations. Um, I've always been a bit of a para-academic, for want of a better word, um, and a lot of the, the research projects we did for MOD uh, were, were quite interesting, uh, very uh, fascinating um, sort of re uh, research projects and literature reviews. Uh, one of them was actually on virtual humans, uh, and we enjoyed doing the literature review so much, uh, we actually ended up writing a whole textbook around the topic, uh, which came out several years ago. Um, and I'm currently writing uh, a series of books or, or co-editing a series of books, uh, the first one of which is on the Metaverse Critical Introduction. Um, that's going to be out in about August or September. Um, and literally, I spent today working on the manuscript for the second book in that, or the second book I'm doing in that series, uh, which is on the met the military metaverse, um, and that will be out uh, beginning of next year, hopefully. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm very much a figure wargamer through and through. Uh, the photo there in the bottom right is from a war game we did of the uh, Battle of Waterloo. Uh, we had about six and a half thousand figures on the table. Uh, the table was twenty feet by eighteen feet. Uh, and we actually end up getting the, the war game covered in the Daily Mirror, uh, one of the UK national newspapers. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so how did I get into doing a PhD on wargaming urban conflict? Um, I'd always thought about doing a PhD, uh, but always assumed it would be around virtual reality and the metaverse and stuff like that. Uh, but I noticed a, a post from uh, John Curry um, to the Wargames Development Group uh, in the Nugget there magazine, asking if people wanted to do a wargaming PhD. Um, and I thought, well, that's too good a an opportunity to miss. Um, so I got in contact with him and we had a discussion around what sort of topic to, to do it on. It just so happened I just spent the previous 18 months uh, actually working with the Land Warfare Centre in the British Army uh, on something called Excise Urban Lion. Um, and my company was actually contracted to, to create the synthetic wrap for that. So basically what we did is we created a system that would generate social media posts or Twitter posts to people playing uh, the exercise, so as to give them that sense that they were actually operating through a city that was full of people, um, rather than just being a big empty sort of ghost town. Um, so we had that system running, uh, and so I sat in on, on well over a dozen war games, uh, all, all based around the urban uh, centre that you can see there. 
Um, and of course, being a war gamer, think, thinking, oh, that'd be an interesting thing to sort of take on and do in a bit more detail. Um, and so it was fairly obvious, given the general interest in urban at the moment, uh, that when we're looking at a topic for a PhD, uh, that doing it on urban wargaming would be the right way to go. And I'm sure it you know, hasn't escaped anybody's notice that there's been, been an increasing interest um, in uh, urban warfare over the last sort of decade or so, decade plus. Um, and this just shows some of the books that have been produced uh, over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and also some of the other initiatives, obviously things like the Urban Warfare Project uh, across a, a Modern Warfare Institute, um, John Spencer's Urban Warfare Project podcast, uh, some of the stuff that the British Army has been doing, some of the stuff the American Army has been doing around mega cities. Um, I was fortunate last week to go along to the, the Army Warfighting Experiment, which is in, I think, year three of a four-year urban series, uh, looking at issues around urban warfare. Um, so it's obviously something that, that, if you like, the audience out there, the professional audience is very interested in. Um, so a good thing for me to, to do the PhD on. This just gives you an idea about sort of what the structure um, of, of the PhD is, or was planned to be, is possibly a better way of putting it. Um, and it's starting off really with, with two different strands. The first strand is looking at urban warfare um, and trying to understand, you know, what's happened in the past, what are the characteristics uh, of urban warfare, what are the sort of doctrines that are in place. Um, and that's been done both through literature review uh, and also through interviews. Um, and then the second strand is on the wargaming side, trying to understand obviously wargaming in general, urban wargaming specifically, uh, playing some of the urban war games that are out there. Um, and again, trying to do interviews with, with wargaming practitioners. The idea then, and it's about the stage I'm at at the moment, or just coming on to, is trying to synthesize out sort of what the characteristics of urban conflict are. Uh, obviously the, the literature documents those fairly well. You know, one of the outputs I'll probably have is a big matrix of sort of all the major uh, or most significant urban battles, uh, what the characteristics are that are coming out of them, cross-reference with the references. So I've got a fairly good sort of solid evidence base about why I'm looking at particular characteristics. Um, and then looking at the war games, the urban war games that already exist, um, and seeing how well they represent uh, those different characteristics, what sort of approaches they take. Um, and that will then lead through to some sort of gap analysis that says, OK, this is what you know we need to model. Uh, this is what we're currently actually modeling. Where's the gaps? You know, where could there be better ways of doing things? Um, and so the phase I'll sort of move on into probably next year is beginning to actually look at, at doing sort of new game design and development uh, driven by that gap analysis, having a good consideration about what we mean by sort of validity in terms of what it is that I'm actually producing um, and then moving into sort of formal gameplays and evaluation. Um, and then ultimately writing up. Of course, the reality is it's nowhere near um, as sort of structured as that. I'm a war gamer. I'm a war game creator and designer. Um, I'm not going to wait three or four years before I start designing a war game. Um, so in reality, you know, from day one, I've been putting, uh, creating war games, trying to gradually increase the level of the sort of research and, and, and the, the, the the solid evidence base uh, that's going into those games and increasingly focusing them uh, on the gaps that I'm actually analysing. So realistically, a lot of this is all happening uh, in parallel. Um, the other thing just to highlight from the banner at the top there is, is my interest is probably from sort of company to, to division level. Um, I'm not too uh, focused in on sort of what's happening at the squad and the section level, sort of room clearing drills, house clearing drills, things like that. Um, I'm far more interested in what's happening once you're beginning to get very much a, not only a combined arms fight, uh, but also a sort of multi-domain fight as well and all the issues that come with that. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, of what the structure of the uh, the PhD itself is going to be. So, you know, in terms of urban conflicts, again, I'm sure that a lot of the battles there on the right hand side are familiar to a lot of you. Um, and obviously, you know, I've had two big major urban conflicts start since I started the PhD, uh, which has been quite interesting. Um, and, you know, some of the ones on the right hand side, you're, you're probably well aware of. Um, I think the things that I found in doing the research um, is, is some of those ones in the sort of the 19th century and the earliest, early 20th century, uh, where we appear to see that, that transition from, from very sort of classic horse and musket type um, conflicts um, in, in up to the end of the 18th century, uh, up, yeah, up to the end of the uh, 18th century. Um, you've got a bit of transition phase sort of during the Napoleonic Wars, you've got very few sieges. Uh, you've got some interesting sort of urban fights in places like Place Noir uh, during Waterloo, in Leipzig, uh, places like uh, Fuentes Dronero, which I was wargaming a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 
where you're beginning to get the idea of sort of light troops operating as smaller units fighting street to street um, and that being a sort of a key part of the battle um, and then during the 19th century itself uh, you've got a whole array of, of different um, battles which are very much urban battles as we would probably understand them um, you know if you look at, at Monterey with the, the American sort of uh, in the American Mexican Wars uh, one of the things you've got there is actually some of the first mentions of mouse holing um, certainly that I've seen in, in sort of the, the more modern literature uh, and I think the earliest I've got so far in that is sort of 1835 um, again, from the Amer the uh, um, the American Mexican Wars, um, you've got Charleston, and if you look, Charleston is one of the first places we've actually got photographs of urban conflict, and the devastation in bits of Charleston is not dissimilar to what we're seeing in Gaza uh, and in the Ukraine. Um, Gravelot, uh, you've got the Battle over Saint Privat, uh, where you're beginning to get to a more modern weaponry. You're beginning to get machine guns. You're getting serious artillery. Uh, you're getting um, uh, uh, breech loading rifles. So that's very much sort of changing the character of, of, of that urban conflict that we're seeing there. Um, and then also sort of far, at, you know, out into the Far East, um, you know, we've got um, things like Beijing and the the attack on the legation uh, during the Box Rebellion. Uh, you've got Shanghai, which was described um, as being uh, Stalingrad on the Yangtze um, in 1937. Um, and you've got Tezer Hung, uh, which is an absolute classic case of, of actually sort of China luring the Japanese uh, into a battle that the Japanese didn't necessarily want to fight, uh, but decided they had to. Um, so all of those, to me, are, are quite interesting sort of transitional battles uh, before we get into the more well-known battles um, of World War II and, and forward from that. One of the other things I think that's come out for me um, is, is that there is this sort of really deep knowledge um, around urban and urban conflict. Uh, the photograph on the left um, is from the Mari slab, um, so uh, in the Middle East, uh, dated to around two and a half thousand, uh, thousand BCE. Um, and, you know, as far as people can work out, what you've got there is somebody who's obviously been trying to scale a wall or is guarding the top of the wall. Uh, they've been shot, they're falling down. You've got the bloke at the bottom with a shield um, so as to protect himself and the people on the top of the wall. Uh, and you've got his bowmen sort of raining down sort of fire on the people on the top of the wall. So you've got, you know, and that's probably only about 500 years later, I think, than the earliest depiction of, of any sort of warfare. So we really have got, got that deep history with urban. Then the, the, the uh, big timeline um, is looking at this thing called poliocetic, poliocetic literature, uh, which is basically literature about sieges. Um, and you've got a whole series of different books uh, that were written um, across this sort of time period. So basically from about 300 BC, um, stretching all the way there um, in terms of the Paleocetic stuff up to about 1100, 1200 uh, AD. Um, and whilst a lot of them are playing on each other, uh, there's a lot of repetition between the different books. What's interesting is that certainly a couple of them, uh, Frontinus and, and Vegetus, you know, their influence basically continued all the way through to people like Clausewitz and Machiavelli. Um, and effectively, those two books have never been unavailable. Uh, because the, the Byzantines picked up on them, the Byzantines were producing them, um, then the French picked up on them, the, the Italians picked up on them. Uh, you find your English translations around about the 1600s. Um, and, you know, you, they are still in print and they're available on the web today. So you've got this really sort of long history about of people thinking about urban warfare. Some of it, yes, is very much about sieges and about siege engines. Uh, but an awful lot of it is about things like deception. It's about isolation of cities. Um, it's about protecting the city from, from relief and all the sort of things that we may well want to think about today. So to me, it's been quite interesting sort of doing the research to understand this sort of deep knowledge that exists there um, in terms of urban warfare. So mo moving sort of slightly more up to date uh, than, than the Greeks and the Byzantines. Um, you know, if you talk about urban warfare, then one of the sort of, sort of the, the, the cornerstones to it is this idea of the urban triad. Um, so the, you've got urban warfare when you've got a civilian population that's significant in size and in density. Uh, they're operating over complex man-made physical terrain, in other words, the, the streets and the buildings of the city. Um, and you've also got an urban infrastructure there that's basically providing, uh, enabling the civilian population to live. Um, and often people talk about this idea about sort of dense urban terrain um, as, as being the thing that sort of makes it a, a particularly uh, difficult problem. Of course, one of the issues is that nobody can um, decide on what what, uh, what to call a city. Um, you know, uh, the US talks about urban centres in their doctrine as being around about uh, 3,000 people. 
uh, the UN sees cities starting at about 50,000 people. Um, you know, 100,000 is, is often taken as being a, a sort of a barrier or a, 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 a typical sort of size of a, a reasonable size city. Um, so there's a lot of debates around, the, or rather, there is no sort of absolute uh, value as to what represents a city, what represents a dead urban terrain. It's the sort of thing you, you know it when you see it. Um, and certainly my, my, my sort of interpretation of that is, is if I have to walk more than three or four blocks and still can't see the edge of anywhere, um, then I'm probably in something that's beginning to be a, a, a significant sort of urban uh, battleground uh, should it be fought over. In terms of the key features of urban conflict, um, I mean, this slide just, just sort of lists some of them, probably the, 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 ma the major ones. I keep having to remind myself I'm not doing a PhD on urban conflict. Um, I'm doing a PhD on wargaming urban conflict. Um, so to a certain extent, you know, I need to be relatively abbreviated in terms of my research into some of these areas, but obviously I've got to understand them to the extent uh, that I can see how they need to be represented um, in a war game and whether or not they should be represented in a war game. Um, and, you know, some of them are probably of more, more interest to me than others, um, but there's a whole bunch of references there. Um, and my, my wiki has, has links to most of these uh, documents if you want to dive into any of those um, in a bit more detail. Um, but obviously, it's one of the challenges with, with, with looking at how we war game urban conflict is how it is we begin to incorporate all those things within a war game without making it far too complicated to actually be played. So as to try and sort of get a, a, a more immediate way of communicating what urban conflict is all about, um, I've sort of been working up on this sort of particular schematic, trying to get people to appreciate the different layers that are involved uh, within urban conflict. Uh, you've got the military forces, you've got the civilian uh, people, uh, civilian population. You obviously may also have black forces, criminals, uh, green forces, the local the local force. Below that, you've got this whole sort of informational layer. And obviously, there's a lot of interest around things like influence at the moment. Um, so you need to understand the informational layer of what's going on within the city. Um, the population itself breaks down into a wide variety of different groups, some of which will be neutral to you, some of which may well be potential allies, some of which may well be potential hostiles. You may well have refugees in there. You may well have different power blocks seizing this as an opportunity uh, to sort of take take control of their part of the city. Um, so you've got cognitive elements there. You've got issues around sentiment uh, you need to be able to track. You've then got the physical layer, the actual structures, the superstructure, supersurfaces of the city uh, and the subterranean elements of it as well. Understanding things like urban terrain zones, the different sorts of building, different sorts of building construction um, and how those change across the city. Uh, you've then got all the infrastructure elements that are represented on the triad. Uh, so from the basic things like, like food, water, gas, uh, electricity, sewers, health, uh, through to the issues around communications, around security, uh, and enduring sort of services around things like transport and education and governance. And obviously with the, the concept of the smart city, you would expect to have an awful lot of sensors and also actuators uh, associated with a lot of that infrastructure, which can potentially uh, be, be a, a lever that can be pulled by either the attacker or a defender. And that is driven or that is managed by that, that cyber layer underneath that is providing the communications infrastructure and the commuting, commu computing infrastructure for the city, which again is a, is a nice potential target for any hacker um, or offensive or defensive cyber operations. It's not only the city though, uh, and a lot of the literature talks about things like the city as organism, uh, the, uh, the city um, as, as a system. So you've got the flows that are happening within the city. We've also got the flows that are going out from the city, um, out into the local region where a lot of the people might actually live, um, out into the, the, the national organization, uh, which is where a lot of infrastructure may well be fed from and where the governance comes from, and also potentially out into the global, the global world, uh, which is where you may have trade, you may even have a lot of, of workers in the city who are actually coming from other parts of the globe. Um, so certainly when you're looking at the strategic level, you need to be understanding those flows in and out of the city as well as what's going on in the city itself. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is, is obviously in order to be able to create war games for this, uh, all this, is trying to sort of develop some, some models that give me a sense of how some of these are linked um, and what sort of things I need to, 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 to represent in the war game. Um, and no doubt, you know, with each war game, it's a question of simplifying each of those models to the, the bits that are re relevant uh, for that particular game. Um, and so this is the one I I've been currently working up around looking at the whole sort of C4ISR and CMA cyber electromagnetic activities uh, type side of things. 
um, because certainly the issue is about understanding where the enemy is um, in order to be able to target them and react to them um, is obviously a crucial issue when, it, when you're operating within the city. So understanding all the different act actions that are, work, that are at work there, uh, all the different tools that we've got, the sensors that we've got in order to be able to detect where the enemy is and what the, the enemy is going to have the same sensors so what we can do to protect against uh, uh, um, identification. All that goes in there. Um, and then the military, so at the moment in the UK, talks a lot about this, this idea of a sensor decider effector chain. Uh, so once we've got that sensing information, we need to decide what we do, which at the level I'm interested in, a lot of that is going to be at something like a brigade headquarters or a battalion headquarters. That's where they're going to be doing the, the targeting. Um, and they're going to pass that information on to the effectors. Uh, but obviously, that the ability to do that is dependent on the communications, which is um, then uh, liable to jamming. Uh, it may be dependent on C2 systems, which may be liable to cyber attack. Um, and the headquarters itself is obviously something that, that can be very vulnerable um, to enemy fires. So you need to have alternate headquarters available uh, and so on. So just trying to develop, so I'm trying to develop several of these models of the, the key areas and the key mechanisms that are of interest to me. Uh, so that what I can then do um, is then represent those uh, in the war games. Um, and just finally in this section, just to give you an idea about sort of from a practical point of view, how much you're going about doing the PhD. Um, when I was sort of rooting around looking at potential tools to use, I came across this thing uh, called Obsidian, uh, which has been an absolute godsend. Um, it's a very simple note taking app. It's got no particular structure to it. It's just a, a place to type in all your notes um and and capture all your images and everything else uh, but the nice thing about it is that actually when you're creating a note you can just link it through a hyperlink to any other note um and then gradually you build up this wonderful connectome uh that, that represents the phd so you can begin to see where you've got sort of centers of gravity if you like in, in the different bits of information you could begin to see where you've got key linkages you can drill down on any point within that connectome um and see what sort of what's linked into it so the example here just purely chosen by chance um, of Battle of Ortona, um, and I can see the links there to all the different points uh, within that uh, within Obsidian that I'm currently referencing Ortona. Um, so hopefully it's, it's proving a very good way uh, to capture the information. Um, and then when I move into a phase where I'm actually then uh, doing sort of more active writing up and research, uh, then I've, I've got all that information nicely linked. So before I move on, that's probably a good point to uh, stop and uh, take any questions if there are at this stage, Sebastian. Hey, David, I don't see any questions here so far, so I think you can just press on. Okay. So one of one of the key things I realized I needed to do when I started um, with a PhD was, was obviously go out and find out what urban war games already existed. Um, I think off the top of my my, my bat, I, I knew of about 20 or 30. Fairly quickly, I expanded that to about 50. Um, and I then realized, hang on, I, I need to manage this in, in, in some way. Um, so I set up a database and I'm trying generally to do the PhD in public. Um, so I set the database up on an application called Airtable. Uh, so the app uh, or the database is there. It's available. You can download the, all the information. Uh, you can sort it online, filter it online. Um, the link to it is, is through my wiki and that'll be on the last side of the presentation. Um, and basically, it's a, it's a place to capture all of the urban war games that I can find out about. And as you can see there, sort of pull out the main features um, of those those war games. Um, when I did, and uh, so I did a paper on that, which is hopefully going into the Moore's Journal uh, this year. Um, it's been submitted, uh, and I've done the minor corrections on it. Uh, so hopefully, it won't be too long uh, till it's approved. Um, when I did that um, August last year, I had about 230 war games um, on the database. Since then, I've added about another 30 or so. Um, but of those, about a third of them are actually new games. Um, a third of them are things I've, I've, I've missed. And, and a third of them are things I've missed, but they are very sort of esoteric. Um, you know, they're, they're um, university uh, final projects and things like that, um, where they may not have a wider distribution or they may be purely self-published and, and not going to get anywhere. So, you know, adding only sort of, or missing, if you like, only 10 war games um, out of that database in the last six months um, suggests to me it's becoming a reasonably complete database um, of certainly hobby war games. Um, obviously, its coverage of um, professional war games is, is a lot less. 
Um, so I've, I've pulled together some slides from the, the, the paper that I did just to give you a sense of sort of what's in that database. Um, so obviously the first thing to do is, is say, well, okay, what battles will be actually got covered? Um, so this shows every battle that has more than one game. Uh, which suggests there's a very long tail um, of lots and lots of, of, of battles with only single games on them. Um, Stalingrad, you know, the, the enduring, Amer I think, North American obsession uh, with the Eastern Front, uh, largely responsible for that, you know, the 26 games on, on the database. Battle of Fay, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, nine, um, and so on and so on. Um, since I put the uh, paper in, I've found a bunch more games around Fallujah, uh, so that's probably now got about as many as uh, games as as play. Um, and I've also found several more on Mogadishu. Uh, so that's probably up to about six now. Um, but it, the, the key thing for me was, was trying to identify what battles are there where I can do some sort of a comparative analysis. So I can look at a battle, study what happened in real life, what the decisions were particularly, um, what some of the constraints were, what the factors were. Um, and then I can see to what extent the war games of that battle uh, reflect those and how different war game designers have taken on the task of trying to create a war game of that particular battle. Um, so, you know, on the basis of, of, of this chart, you know, probably everything from about arc and upwards has probably got enough to, to justify doing it. One of the issues, obviously, is although it says there might be four games there or five games there, that's no guarantee of I can actually get hold of those games. And in fact, a, a large part or a, a significant part of the, of the article I did for Moores is actually talking about the problems of doing war games research and trying to identify copies of games to actually do the research on. Um, so just because it's saying that there's five battle, five war games of Budapest is no guarantee I can actually get hold of five. Uh, so it may well be it doesn't pass the threshold in terms of having enough war games to actually do the analysis on. But, you know, that, that, that gives us a sense of, of which battles are, are well covered um, and could be subject to some sort of comparative study. Another thing is, is looking at, at what the, the, the level of the war game is. Um, I'll be very, very explicit here. When I talk about the level of a war game, I'm talking about the force that's involved, not the manoeuvre unit. Um, I've had some very confused discussions with some American war gamers where I know it's certainly in the American board game fraternity. Uh, then often if you say something is company size, they think it's company manoeuvre units. Whereas certainly to me and to most figure gamers, company size tends to mean you're fighting with a company uh, and that's the way the battle's going. Um, but, you know, what we can see from here is we've got a fairly reasonable spread um, in terms of, of the, the representation. Um, again, I think the re the re or one of the reasons why we've got a very large numbers of armies is obviously with more historic battles, there was just an army um, rather than it being you know, uh, anything else and split into cores and divisions and so on. So that's probably why army is sort of overrepresented. Uh, likewise, a lot of games, all I can do is put them down as faction. You know, if it's some sort of a, a more of a, a riot based game or an internal security game. Um, or even a, some sort of asymmetric games, uh, you've only got factions on either side. You haven't necessarily got formal troops. Uh, so that's why that's quite sort of heavily represented. Um, but you know, in that middle block, you've, you've got a fairly good spread of games uh, set at most of the levels uh, that I'd be interested in looking at. One of the interesting things, one of the things I did was to look at how has the, the, the way that games have been uh, designed changed over time. Um, and this is looking at the changes in area representation. Um, so basically out of 100% for all games uh, produced in that particular year, uh, which could in some cases be just one game, of course, um, then you know how many of them used hexes as the way of representing area movement, how many used areas, uh, how many used cards, how many used squares, and how many uses, used topological grids, which are effectively the inverse of an area. Um, and, you know, one thing that's probably quite apparent just from looking at that diagram is the extent to which we've seen more and more urban war games uh, make use of areas. We've also seen more use of cards uh, and potentially even more use of squares um, over the sort of the last decade, two decades or so, in comparison to the sorts of classic SBI hex and counter war game uh, that was being produced back in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, and certainly my feeling um, is that, you know, areas typically are a better way of representing uh, the urban urban terrain within within a war game uh, than hexes. The final bit of analysis was to actually look at um, the, the, what I've called the level of downness. Um, so anybody with a military background is probably familiar with the idea that when you give orders at, say, brigade, uh, you're instructing your battalions what to do, but you've been told to think two down uh, so as to give them some ideas as to what you want their companies to do. Um, 
certainly a number of the professional war games I've come across have only been one down um, in terms of what they're representing. Um, as I say, that you, you think two down typically in orders and planning. Um, but, you know, what's evident from this is in a lot of cases, you know, the, the, the most common uh, level of downness for a war game is actually four down. Uh, people like having a, seem to like having a lot of counters out on the table to play with. Um, and actually, if you just gave them the counters for two down, they wouldn't feel like they, they've got enough counters to, to sort of warrant a war game. One of the downsides of that, of course, is it means that probably those games are far going to take far too long to play and probably be far too complex uh, to use directly with a military audience, uh, depending on what, what sort of, of, of game you had in mind. Um, and so not necessarily quite so easy to pick up a lot of, of hobby, hobby games um, and deploy them across to the military. But just getting a sense of those levels, the different levels of, of, of granularity effectively um, across the different sorts of war games has been quite useful. So I'm sure people will want to know, well, you know, what war games do I like? What war games don't I like uh, when it comes to urban war games? Um, so what I've done here is, is spread across looking at the different levels. Um, so from sort of from tactical up to, to operational up to strategic. Um, and the games I've come across so far, that I think I think are, are, are pretty reasonable. Um, I would guess at the moment out of that 250, I've probably pay, played maybe 15% of them. Um, but that 15% has been very much guided by what people have said are the best games. Uh, so DSTL did a study a few years ago. Uh, 40th Infantry Division has a list on their website. Uh, so I've tried to prioritise playing those games uh, before I go off to, to, to look at some of the others. Um, you know, in, in terms of then the, the, the games, I think are doing things quite nicely. Um, I mean, Tango Down, if you want something that's very much individual manoeuvre unit, so single man counters or single person counters, very much fighting, you know, through a building. Um, I think Tango Down works very nicely. Um, and it, it deals with those those issues that always turn up in skirmish type games around, you know, what happens if I kick the door down and then try and throw the, the grenade in and you're there waiting for me? Who gets to shoot first? So a lot of those nitty gritty things, it's actually got some really nice solutions for. Um, so certainly if you want a, a, a very uh, skirmish level game, I'd certainly recommend that one. Um, Evan Delisandro shooting Daedalus, same sort of level. Uh, what's interesting about this one is it's done as a vertical game. Um, so as you can see from the, the tiles there, you, you've, you've basically got the stairwells and you've got the different floors. So you're not worrying too much um, about the two dimensional space within a room. You're far more interested in the vertical dimension of getting up the building and down the building. Uh, and moving stairwell to stairwell. So that's quite a nice a, a nice and different approach. Um, if we move, move up to sort of platoon force size, um, then Ed Farron from Fight Club has been working on Take That Street. Um, and that's been going through a number of iterations. That's turning into quite a nice game. Uh, very much square-based uh, grids, as you can see. Also increasingly now looking at using dummies um, and blocks in order to be able to hide sort of representations of units and things like that, which is certainly something I've, I've used a lot in my games. Um, Urban operations. I've still actually haven't actually played it. Everybody says wonderful things about it. Um, my order is in for the second printing, so hopefully that will turn up uh, in the next uh, couple of months, and I'll get a chance to actually play that. Um, and Pavlov's house was something very different. Um, and one of the nice things about Pavlov's house, that's so looking at, at uh, Stalingrad, is it's played at three different scales. So your map board, one part of the map is showing the individual house. Uh, and where Pavlov and his, his soldiers are, individual soldiers, uh, individual windows with individual weapons. Uh, the middle part is showing the avenues of attack um, and showing things effectively at more like sort of section type level, for want of a better word. Um, and then the, the third board is actually looking at the whole of the area of Stalingrad around the house um, and looking at issues more to do with sort of supply, um, artillery, trying to block resupply from across the river. Um, so that idea of actually taking three different perspectives um, on a single battle um, is quite a nice way of doing things. Um, if we move up to companies uh, level, um, City Fight, I'll say a little bit more about this in due course. Um, ostensibly, it's designed for, for a city level, uh, uh, sorry, company level force. I think if you're trying to play it actually as, as presented at company level, it would just take you forever. Um, but the nice thing about the game is it's designed to be played double blind. Uh, so your, you and your opponent sat back to back. It comes with two complete sets of maps, two complete sets of counters. Um, and effectively, it's like playing battleships, but where battleships move. Um, and so you call out a, 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 what do they call a mega hex, which is a group of seven hexes. Uh, and your, op your op opponent tells you whether or not they've got a piece in, in any of the, the uh, seven hexes, uh, but they don't tell you what it is. And of course, the minute they've told you, they've got the ability to move it straight out that hex, possibly the next turn. 
uh, or even the next activation. Um, so it really sort of brings home some of the issues about situ situational awareness uh, and ISR. Um, a more conventional game at about company force level uh, is Donetsk, Battle for the Airports. This is looking at the, uh, the 2014 uh, battle. Um, it's a fairly straightforward hex encounters uh, game, but quite nicely done. Uh, it does have the issues, oh, sorry, it, it, it represents things like the, le the levels in a building um, and being able to occupy different levels and have different protection depending on where you are in the building. Um, and so, yeah, sort of looked at that quite closely when you started doing Take That Street. Um, and it's very generic, which actually has the advantage of you could use it in probably in all sorts of ways um, for, for any sort of similar battle and the like. Um, moving up to sort of more like battalion force, um, there appears to be a bit of a, a gap, uh, if you look back to the, uh, the previous slides, um, in terms of battalion level games. Um, a Week in Hell on Battle of Way is probably one of the nicer ones that's at, uh, at that sort of level. Um, if you then move up into Brigade, uh, we've got sort of, sort of three very different games there. Uh, the Battle for Ramadi is a solo game. It's fo uh, focused purely on, on, one, on uh, the fight in the centre of the city. Um, and it's a bit of a slog, it's got to be said. But there again, Battle for Ramadi was apparently a bit of a slog. Um, so not an awful lot of tactical options. Um, you're, you're playing against a, an asymmetric enemy, so you're not quite sure what the opposition is going to be. Um, but it is at brigade level. Um, Into a Bear Trap um, is a well-respected game that's certainly on the DSTL list. I think it's on the 40 ID list. Again, a bit like City of Donetsk, it's a fairly straightforward hex encounter game, uh, but it is one which is certainly considered, uh, you know, a lot of the issues around urban, um, even down to sort of the ability for tanks to turn around or not um, in streets. Um, so not a bad game at all. Um, and then City of Confusion, which is our, another game on Battle of Huey, uh, but looks at the whole of the city um, and what that captures quite nicely is the difference between sort of the asymmetric fight and the symmetric fight, depending on which part of, of the North Vietnamese troops you're you fighting, whereabouts, the differences between fighting in different parts of the city, uh, the rules of engagement that you, you've got, which might be different in different parts of the city as well. Um, and you end up with about a brigade force in that. Um, and then, you know, if you go up to division, uh, then Brown Trains, uh, quick, quick urban integrated combat Kriegspiel. Um, is probably sort of a, a good representation um, of, of quite an abstract game that's beginning to look at how, whereas the, the, the concern of Brigade is a little bit more on the kinetic fight, and certainly all the games shown there are very much kinetically based games. Uh, by the time you get to Division, you, it's beginning to be a little bit more of a, a multi-domain fight. You're beginning to be more concerned about some of the combat enablers, um, and so Quick very much shifted, shifts your focus into that area. Um, I must admit, the first version of it was a little bit too abstract for me, uh, but the second uh, version, which I hope to get on the table next week, um, is a little bit more anchored in sort of real geography, um, which hopefully I'll, I'll find speaks to me a little bit better. Um, the two games I've got in the bottom in red are games that quasi I don't think I would see, uh, I would recommend, um, which I'm sure will upset an awful lot of people. Um, Storm over Arnhem, the, the, the mechanic of it is wonderful, um, and, and I've used that mechanic myself in other games. Um, and it's been used in a lot of, of, of other very good games. However, I can't say that playing it, I had any sense of fighting in an urban area. Um, you know, I just had an area which had a slightly different rating to another area, and that was it. Um, so a good mechanic, but I don't think a good representation of necessarily an urban war game. Um, and then Berlin 85, um, which is, you know, a wonderful hex encounter map, incredible amount of detail on it. Um, I think it's got about two levels, maybe three levels of sort of urban strength, uh, depending on sort of the different urban terrain zones. But it highlights the problem that certainly I have with a lot, a lot of hex encounter games is that you, you spend a lot of your time sort of trying to optimize the hex layout and, and how you're doing attacks purely in terms of the way that the map is laid out with the hexes. Um, and the other issue obviously you've got with having a, an urban game with a hex layout is that the, the urban city typically doesn't conform uh, to anything like sort of the, the, the hex grid itself. Uh, so you're a little bit sort of um, disconnected from the terrain you're actually playing over. Um, there's a new version of it coming out, um, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not that's sort of improved some of the things. Um, but one of the things, it, um, it has the ability to create rubble, but the conditions for creating rubble are relatively limited. Um, so it doesn't typically cause a problem, whereas I'm sure for reality, uh, it probably would be quite significant. And then sort of up to sort of the, the operational and strategic level, um, probably no surprise that, you know, We Are Coming Nineveh is there, uh, a very uh, well-respected, uh, well-received game. Um, and 
it uses areas which I like. He uses blocks with with uh, so as to provide some sense of of, of um, missing information, uh, which I like. Um, and it's very much showing an, an asymmetric fight. Um, I was quite fortunate to be able to play We Are Coming Gaza, uh, which is the version uh, that Brian did uh, for Gaza um, in the week between the, the initial attack by Hamas and, and, and the Israeli response. Um, so as part of this this whole uh, sort of war game is journalism and getting you to think about you know what's coming in different ways or what's happened in different ways. That was quite a, a good experience to actually do that uh, before the, the attack itself went in. Um, War in the mega city, um, probably a, operating at a similar sort of level, um, but taking a very different take on things. Uh, it's, it's very much topologically based rather than area based. Um, it's trying to look at the, the, the different nature of different areas. It's trying to bring in some of the issues around sort of influence and cyber. Um, the big problem with it is that there is obviously not a lot of talk between the, uh, the people who actually wrote it and the artwork department that then produced it in the magazine. Um, and it's almost unplayable, um, actually, as published, because there are so, so many errors and mismatches uh, between different bits of information. Um, but the actual hub of what's there, I think, is actually quite good, and, and certainly something I'm looking at using uh, as inspiration uh, for uh, one of my own games. So just to end this section, I just want to do a little bit of a deep dive um, around the battles of Huey. So to me, this is very much the PhD in miniature. Um, so it's a question of, of, of taking the, the, that, that approach I showed at the very beginning, which is saying, look, let's look at the real battle. Uh, let's see what happened. Let's see what the factors were. Let's have a look at the war games, uh, which have been, been done on that battle. And then let's sort of compare how the two, how the two fit. Um, so the map on the right, uh, the, the, the base map there is Vietnam Battle Spway. Um, and then all of the other maps are actually overlaid onto it. So you can see there the Battle of Hue, exclamation mark, was purely looking at the American fight on the southern part of the Perfume River, um, you know, whereas a couple of others were looking at, at, at sort of uh, the, the whole of the major city. And Vietnam Battle Sway was the only one to look um, at the whole area, including La Chu, which is where the uh, the Vietnamese uh, headquarters was. Um, and you've got the stats there on the left hand side drawn from uh, Board Game Geek in terms of their difference levels of complexity. So you've got all the way from two up to 4.6 um, and also the player ratings. Um, and then the different ways in which they're regulating space, the sort of scales that involved and so on. This is the long list. Um, out of that lot, um, I, I didn't follow up on several of them. Uh, so ATS, which is an advanced to Brook system scenario, um, 65, Way City Map, both of those are effectively extensions or scenario sets uh, for very tactical games. Uh, Fields of Fire 2 is a card-based game. It, um, again, an ex expansion set for a very tactical card-based game. Um, so I didn't look at those three, uh, but I looked at the rest of them. Um, and, and so what I did was I looked, looked, read through the battles uh, accounts, uh, mainly for or, or almost exclusively um, secondary sources, um, identified from that the features that appear to be reoccurring in, in the different descriptions of the battle. Um, so things like particularly CS, use of CS gas um, in the battle, uh, the fact there's a lot of riverine activity along the Perfume River, uh, the problems there were in coordination between the American forces um, and the South Vietnamese forces. Um, the fact there were operations happening beyond the city. The fact the Americans were hampered by rules of engagement. There was a huge civilian population in the city. Uh, the actual attack was staged um, basically on, on, on the, the, uh, the Tet celebration. So the city was packed with, with revelers. Um, unfortunately, some of those revelers were also Viet Cong who'd infiltrated the city. Um, and political and media. And, and one of the reasons for that I think Huey itself has a lot of battles um, is because it was quite a pivotal battle, uh, sorry, a lot of war games, is because it was quite a pivotal battle in the Vietnam War. It was a city, it was accessible, journalists could easily get into it. They didn't need to ride in a Huey, Huey helicopter to get there. Um, and they were actually able to report almost, um, you know, as the battle itself was raging, or certainly towards the end of it. Um, and it's the coverage of the Battle of Bay was, was is taken as being one of the things that turned American tide of opinion against the Vietnam War. So that's why it's a focus on a lot of writing um, and obviously also a, a number of war games. Um, actually, when I submitted the paper uh, to the journal, uh, which is the Journal of Strategic uh, Security, um, they actually rejected this table uh, because they said it, it was far too um, uh, subjective. Um, but I think it's very hard to work out how I would do a, an objective assessment of all of these. And for a lot of people, you know, this is probably the sort of thing you want, at least as a first glance, just to get a sense of, of what the differences are between the different war games. 
um, in terms of the different parts that they're focusing on. So you can see some things like staggered reinforcements. Everybody knew or all the war games re represent the fact um, that, particularly on the on the well, on the American side, reinforcements were coming in steadily over the course of, of the the period, as the Americans realised how serious a fight that this was going to be. Um, uh, whereas other areas, um, you know, in terms of things like uh, the operations beyond the city are very poorly covered, uh, the river iron activity fairly poorly covered, specialist tanks only covered by a couple of games. So we've, we've got a variety of different levels of, 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 of coverage of those key factors. Of One of the things to emphasise is I wasn't trying to say, you know, does the war game actually predict or, or, or confirm the outcome of the battle? We don't see war games as, as a predictive tool. It's far more about exploring a space of possibilities. So I was far more interested in whether or not, you know, some of the key sort of decisions, some of the key factors that influence the battle, whether they were represented. Um, and the conclusions from the paper, and again, a link to that is, is on the wiki, um, is, is first of all, you know, these war games represent 20, probably 30 years worth of war game design evolution. Um, and it is an evolving art. And, and the most recent battle uh, games are very different to the first sort of hex encounter games that were created on the Battle of Way. Secondly, that urban warfare is complicated. There are an awful lot of factors to be considered. Um, and quite honestly, no one game is likely to be able to cover it all in something that's actually playable. Um, and what that tends to suggest is maybe what you want is something that's a little bit like um, a, a, a nested approach, a, a different set of war games using different techniques uh, to look at the different aspects of the battle. Um, the third thing is, is obviously this difference between, you know, these are all hobby games, um, and so they don't necessarily translate into what it is a professional audience might want to get, unless they're obviously purely interested in the, in the historical side of what was going on in the battle. But if we look at more modern games, particularly maybe something like Fallujah, or where they may be more, more interested in copying across to uh, the military, uh, there isn't necessarily the same ability to do that. Um, and finally, you know, almost all the games miss that strategic context of what was going on in the bigger picture. Um, and that, again, sort of argues towards something like a nested approach. We have made maybe a matrix type game to look at the strategic context. Um, and then you have one of these games, maybe something like City of Confusion, uh, to look at, at the, the, the battle as, as a whole. Um, and then one of the ones that was looking at the uh, um, sort of like block by block that looks at the very detailed sort of tactical situation. Uh, so to get a sense of what it was like on the ground. But it's certainly been useful for me just to get a sense of, of what the overall approach can be to the PhD in terms of being able to look at these different war games, look at these different features, um, and then see what the sort of coverage is, and then think how it is I could go about creating potentially a better game uh, or set of games on the battles of play. Okay, I'll take another break there, Seb. So if there's any questions, happy to handle them now. Yeah, so we got a couple. Uh, first one, it says, any urban characteristic that you feel is too difficult to war game or is incredibly difficult to represent correctly? I, I don't think I'd rule anything out yet. Um, I think where I am in, in the research is more a question of, of trying to, to, to collect them um, and then beginning to look at how they've been covered so far. Um, I, I think I'll touch on that a little bit towards the end, actually, um, when we come to talk about some of the recent developments. Um, and and yes, yeah, some, some of the things I think are the biggest challenges, I think I've probably picked up on the last slide. So let's leave that for then. Similarly, um, you may answer this later, but someone else asks, are there characteristics of urban warfare uh, within games that have specific trade-offs in representing them well in games, like you know, C2 versus combat granularity or something like that? Um, I, I think the one that has the most obvious trade-off is in terms of, of representing the hidden information, um, because you know, a lot of urban is about trying to work out where the enemy is. Um, and being able to respond to that and, and, and put the ISR assets or whatever it is in order to identify where the enemy is. And I think the minute you start to represent that, it, it immediately begins to lift the complexity of the game that you're creating. Um, and, and, you know, almost all these games are, are you know, op open displays on, on a shared map, um, very easy to play. Uh, you know, the, of the ones I've, I've mentioned so far, you know, City Fight is actually double blind. Uh, Take That Street is using blocks. Uh, but it immediately begins to lift a little bit the complexity of what it is your the, the war game represents and, and trying to get it played but i think unfortunately if you want to get urban anything like right um you probably need to do at least something in that direction and, and again that will become apparent from uh, some of my games <laughs> 
So uh, someone asked this, are there any game design ideas taken from science fiction or fantasy games or other rules? Uh, someone else mentioned miniature rules. Um, yeah, I, I'm, in terms of miniature rules, I'm tracking, I, I, I've not put miniature rules on the database, um, mainly because almost any miniature rules has, has a paragraph about how to use it, how, how to use it in urban. Um, so, so, so I'm looking at them, but I'm not including them on the database. Um, but a couple of examples, though, um, actually, when I, when I talk about uh, one of war games in, in, in a moment, um, that was based on Drop Zone Commander, uh, which is a sci-fi miniatures game, uh, which actually DSTL identified as being quite an interesting set of urban rules. Um, it's got some quite nice um, issues for collateral damage in it. Uh, that's probably the biggest differentiator between it and anything else I've seen. So a nice, a nice rule, set of rules there that you could lift and put into any other game. Um, Starship Troopers, the old uh, SBI game, um, that has a hidden map for doing the tunnels for the bugs, uh, which is quite a nice way of looking at subterranean. Um, and also in miniatures games, uh, there was a, a after action review I read somewhere of somebody doing, I think, a 28 mil um, urban game. And what they had is they had the table laid out with all the buildings. Uh, that the players were fighting over when a, when a player said, okay, I'm going into this building, you know, can I check out its cellar? Um, the umpire brought out a standard full scat box file um, and in that he had the cellar. And you then played the fight through the cellar and then pop back out the cellar and put the box file away and carry on on the main table, which I thought was quite an idea, nice idea. So yes, I think there are definitely ideas from, from both miniature gaming and from science fiction gaming. Um, fantasy... I think the interesting thing with fantasy, there was a discussion at Wargames Development uh, last year, I think it was, um, around actually how you could use magic to basically just represent capabilities. And you just haven't got to worry about how they how the capability has been created. It's just a question of would this be a useful capability if we had it, uh, which I think is quite a nice take on, on how you could just sort of use magic in games um, as a way of sort of exploring some of that, that potential sort of capability development. Um, so another question asked, lots of war gamers and war game designers and players create homebrew rules for games to fix things they see wrong. Um, do you, have you looked into any of that for your research in terms of urban gaming? Um, so if, if, they, if I come across them, um, then yes, uh, then, then sort of more than happy to, to collect that information. Um, it possibly needs a slightly wider sweep of the, of, of the war gaming sort of blogosphere than I'm doing at the moment. Um, but yeah, certainly if I'm seeing sort of homebrew ideas, and certainly some of the games that are on the database, you know, are self-produced, you know, almost a, a few sides of A4 and that's it. Uh, so they're almost on that sort of level anyway. Um, but yes, as far as I'm concerned, you know, any ideas that are out there that I can can gather, I'm certainly interest, interested in doing that. Uh, another question asks, how do you explore mor the moral aspect or not moral, morale aspect of uh, urban warfare? Do you mention that later in the presentation? If so, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'll come on to that. Yeah. Then I think this is a great time just to press and we'll keep questions coming. Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about now is, is sort of my urban uh, games and the, the games I've been working on. Um, so this gives you an idea about, about the sort of time sequence of what I've been looking at. Um, each of these games has been publicly playtested, um, either at Connections UK, BCAL, which is the virtual conference of war gamers, the conference of war gamers, um, or at, at DSET, which is a, a military uh, training uh, conference in the UK. Um, and as you can see, the majority are in that, as I said earlier, that sort of company to division area, uh, which is where I'm primarily interested. Uh, so what I'll do is just, just step you very briefly uh, through each of them, just to give you a sense of, of, of what I've been doing. Um, so the first one is Festum Altona. Uh, this is actually based on Christmas in Hell, uh, which uses the Storm Over Arnhem system. Um, however, it has possibly one of the worst maps. In fact, I'm going to start collecting a rogues gallery of, of dreadful urban maps in war games. Um, but it has a map that bears absolutely no relation to, to, to the real ground. Um, it does use areas, but those areas are, are, are not aligned to anything that, that's in, in, the, in the, the real terrain. Um, so I basically rebuilt the, the game almost completely, uh, apart from still using the Storm Over Arnhem system. Um, and it's designed to be primarily a, a solo game. Um, so, although you can play it sort of, of uh, collaboratively, effectively. One of the big things that I did in this game, uh, because certainly from the reading of, around Altona, is I made a big thing about the rubble, which is something it does inherit from Christmas in Hell. Uh, so you'll see on the inset there, you've got a four counter, a two counter, a one counter for ru rubble. Um, but I changed the mechanism for creating rubble. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that mechanism in a moment. Um, but basically, as, as you fight, if you use overkill, 
then you will start creating rubble. If you create rubble, A, it gives the defender better protection, uh, and B, it stops your tanks getting down the roads. Um, and some of the roads are so narrow, they couldn't get the tanks down there anyway. Um, so it begins to sort of shift the focus a little bit to, to, to be a bit more aware about the collateral damage that you're causing um, as you fight your way through through the city or through the town. Um, one of the things I just, so, so Ortona takes about two hours to play. Um, one of the things I realized was actually if all you're trying to do is teach people about some of the issues of urban, they didn't need to fight through a whole urban battle. Uh, so what I did was I took the, the mechanics that I developed for, for uh, Festo uh, and abstracted those out into a, into a card based game uh, called Rubble Town. Uh, so this is actually I've got a, a PowerPoint version of this online. So it's actually possible to just download the PowerPoint and play it straight off the PowerPoint. Uh, or you can sort of print it out. Um, and I'm currently doing a modern version that I'll, I'll use it at Cal this year. Um, and so basically, as you see there, you've, you've got the street you're going to be fighting down. Um, as you move down the street, you, you turn over the card that represents the street, which tells you what the, the protection value is of the buildings, how much rubble is already there. Uh, you draw a bunch of event cards, which might show you, as in this example, you, you're facing a sniper, a German position and a minefield. Uh, you've built your force to clear the street at the bottom. So this is the, the classic sort of starter set of a, a rifle platoon, a Sherman, a bunch of sappers, a six pounder gun. So this is the sort of thing they used at Ortona. Um, and then the aim is to then try and you know clear the enemy um, uh, out of the, the next part of the street and then fight on to the next one. The key mechanic that I did with this um, is you'll notice that the, the infantry units have got a blue number, uh, which represents small caliber weapons. The tanks and the, the anti-tank guns have got a red number which represents large caliber uh, weapons. Um, each of those is a dice. So in this case, if you're, I'm the uh, the Canadians there at the bottom, I'd be rolling five blue dice and I'd be rolling six red dice. Um, I then deduct dice starting with the blue dice for how much rubble there is and, and the protection value. So I'd lose uh, in this current square on with A, uh, we'd lose two for rubble, two for defense value. So I'd end up rolling one blue dice and three red dice. And I'm looking for typically for, for fives for a kill. Um, the issue is if I get any doubles amongst those red dice, then that adds to the rubble. And if I get two doubles or triple, I get two extra rubble. Um, so I've got a choice to make every single time about do I throw all, all of my guns at it, at the target to try and eliminate it? Um, or do I actually try and hold off on things? Because if I actually create too much rubble, uh, then my tank's going to get stuck. Um, and I'm going to have to do the rest of it uh, without the tank. or I'm going to have to wait a turn or two whilst we actually bring the sappers up and get the sappers to clear the rubble. Um, and I found that, that that's proven to be quite a nice little mechanic. Um, and Rubble Town plays in about 20 minutes. Um, and actually at the conference last year, we had two different people playing it, both playing their own games, sort of head to head effectively, see who could get down the, the street fastest. Um, and that's the sort of way in which I'd sort of encourage it to be played. Um, so that's Rubble Town. As I say, details of all of these games are on the, on the wiki. Um, this issue about situational awareness um I, I think is obviously one of the key issues around, around urban um and so for the virtual conference of war gamers which is an online conference uh, last year i decided well okay let's do a game which which plays to the environment uh, you know most of the conference is held on zoom so let's let's do this as a game that runs on zoom um although i also use jitsi um so the way that this game works is that each of the players and the way i did it is we had two teams of two players um both on the same side uh, all they get is basically that smartphone camera that you can see sat on the city there. And I've actually got the city model behind me. Um, all they get is their smartphone camera view, which is suitably grainy and out of focus, which is wonderful. Um, and they just tell me what they want to do with their with their vehicle. Um, do they want to go forward? Do they want to go to, up to the you know turn left, turn right? Um, and then if they see something, they can tell me if they want to fire at it. Um, and in fact, I use the drop zone commander rules very stripped down to actually do the, the combat resolution for this. Uh, because quite honestly, that was secondary to just the issues about trying to navigate around the city. Um, just to make things slightly harder, when I put the two vehicles in, I put them in at right angles to each other. So one of them came in at the bottom of the board, the one came in at the right hand side of the board. Uh, we actually had a company commander who only had voice comms, so he couldn't see the view out of any of the tanks because he wouldn't have done it in 1985. Um, he purely had his voice to, to talk to the two platoon commanders to find out what was going on, to find out what they could see. Um, and so the first thing he had to do was actually just get the, both of the units aware of where each other were so they could actually act in concert. Uh, then they had to go hunt through the city in the first pass with recce vehicles. They had to find a particular objective. Um, and then having found the objective, we then brought through the, the um, uh, basically the company group 
uh, to actually try and secure it. Um, in the meantime, the enemy was busy firing back. There were a bunch of civilians. Um, and quite honestly, at two feet distance through a smartphone with 10 millimeter figures, I mean, the size of tank that I'm talking about is, is about that for a BMP. Um, trying to work out whether or not one of those figures was a civilian or a Russian soldier was actually very hard. Um, and there were several bits of, of, of people opening fire on, on the civilian population. Uh, there are also cases of people opening fire on, on, on trees and bushes and everything else, anything else they saw in the distance. Um, it was a very sort of fast and furious game um, described by a lot of uh, several of the participants as being basically like a dungeon crawl because you just really didn't want to poke your head around the corner of a building uh, because you didn't know what was going to be there and, and waiting for you. Um, but as a way of giving people that sense of, of the challenges in trying to work out how you navigate through a city, how you coordinate actions through a city um, in a game that basically used a bunch of cardboard buildings and some, some smartphones um, and about 30 quid's worth of, of toy models. Um, it was a really nice game and certainly something I'll, I'll look to run, to run at another time. On a slightly more, sort of more, more, more serious uh, level, uh, and this is probably to me the, the 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 game that I've done so far, which is closest to being sort of a, a product of the PhD uh, and the sort of game that I want to sort of ha have at the end of the PhD. Uh, this is a game called City and SEMA. So it's about brigade level. Um, you'll see that it's area based. Um, almost all the games I do, I tend to try and base them on real geography because I think it gives you a... a, a it gives you all the issues that real geography throws up. You know, it's just not perfect. It's always got things in the wrong place. Um, and so it's good to have that in the game. Uh, so this is based on, on the town of Redditch uh, or a small city of Redditch, uh, just south of where I live in Birmingham. Um, so I've got the different terrain zones uh, marked out there. Um, it's played with, with, as you can see, with blocks. So you're hiding um, the, uh, the nature of each of your units. There's a lot of dummy blocks as well. Uh, that are in there. So you, just because you can see a block doesn't actually mean there's forces there. Um, and it was played as a, as, a, as a competitive game between two teams um, as they basically, as, as, as Red tries to, to do the break in battle um, and then fighting through the city. One of the key things about when I was designing this game, um, and it's something that came out of, of the, the Urban Lion work, uh, was that gave me an awareness of this thing called USECT. Um, understand, shape, engage, consolidate, and transition, which is sort of the, the US and NATO doctrine for, for doing urban. Um, and the good thing about it, as far as I'm concerned, is that it shifts your, your focus or, your, or your, your horizons away from purely that kinetic battle, which is basically the engage phase, uh, to looking at all the stuff that comes before the battle and all the stuff that comes afterwards. And I think if you're going to be serious about uh, developing a war game for urban conflict, rather than just a, a, a urban war game, if you like, then you know you need to have that wider horizon. Um, so the way the game plays is it actually breaks through into those phases. Um, so the understand phase um, is when they're, where they're given the map of the city um, and they're given a essentially an intelligence budget to buy knowledge of the city. Um, and so I produced a number of, of single page sheets uh, which gave them things like, you know, where does the where does the uh, sewage pipes go? Where are the, the electricity distribution stations? Where are the DIY shops that you can use for to get defence stores? What's the local demographics like? Uh, where are the schools? Um, so they could buy those bits of information. Um, and again, a good reason for doing the game on based on a real terrain um, is the fact I could actually find open source information for all of this lot, uh, and put that into the briefings. Uh, so they do that. Uh, that gives them a, a sense of a knowledge of the city. They then enter a shape phase. Um, and so you've got a number of capability cards uh, that they can buy or that they've got an allowance for capability cards to buy. Um, and they can work out which of those they want to use. So can, do they want to focus on kinetic cards or non-kinetic cards? So you've got the, sort of the full sort of multi-domain element coming in here. Um, certainly for the defender, uh, you've got civil affairs actions in there about trying to manage the civilian population. Uh, you've got cyber um, actions, both cyber defense to try and protect the cyber infrastructure and cyber hacking to try and hack the infrastructure. Um, and you've also got a city dashboard that shows you sort of what the state of the, the utilities are um, across the city. Uh, and there's, there, there are linkages there. So if you take out power, that will also say take out CCTV. Um, so it's only once you've done that, that you actually get into the engage phase, uh, which is where you then actually fight the battle. Um, and again, the you know there's a lot of generation of rubble in there. Uh, there's civilian casualties, civilian displaced persons. You've got industrial fires, uh, you know, breaking out. You, you start fighting around one of the industrial areas. Um, if you've got civilian population being generated, uh, basically trying to flee from a, from a, a, a shelling, 
then they're not going to they're going to move across the map um, and they're going to be a problem to you until you get a civil affairs team to get them out. Um, and then you've also got a, an adverse opinion track. Um, so, you know, the more destruction that you you, you create, uh, then the greater the adverse opinion in sort of the outside world will be around what you're doing. Um, once you actually get to the end of the battle, uh, you then go into a consolidate and transition phase. Uh, and for the war game so far, I've sort of looped that, grouped those together. And that's really a discussion led phase. So it's no longer actually the war game, uh, but it's actually just talking through, you know, given the state of play, given what we've ended up on the map. Um, then what's going to happen next in terms of military terms? So is the defender or whoever's got the city, are they going to be consolidating? What they're going to do, how they're going to recover? Um, if you've been booted out of the city or if you didn't fail to get into the city, you know, what would you plan in terms of a counterattack? Um, but then also looking at the impact of the, on the city and the population. Um, and I've got some sort of, uh, you know, rubric equations to work out, you know, what the, the net impact would be on the city in terms of people uh, kill, killed, people wounded, what's the capability of the local hospitals? Um, and, and then thinking through sort of how the city might recover in the short, the long and the medium term. So, so that's the way that the, the, that game works at a, at a top level. Um, and again, just to re-emphasize the sort of change of emphasis, you know, if you look at the, the turn phases, well, actually the kinetic bits about attacker doing fire and maneuver and defender doing fire and maneuver are actually only one small part of what's happening. Actually, a large chunk of every turn is actually more on the C2 type issues. Uh, so looking at MCON, looking at electronic warfare, uh, looking at command points, which are affected by communications uh, and, and cyber attack and the like, and jamming, um, playing the cards that you've got in terms of capability cards, um, and then actually doing the comms check so as to make sure you can then pass your orders down to the units you've got on the ground. Um, and then at the end, going through things like the civilian movement, morale checks, and so on. Um, so as I say, hopefully out of that game, the, that traditional kinetic war game actually becomes a, quite a small part um, of the overall experience of looking at, at what's happening before the battle, after the battle, and even during the battle, uh, looking at all those C2 type issues. Uh, and so I'm for, doing further work on that and, and hopefully going to do a battalion level version, which will hopefully be playable in, in a couple of hours, uh, so as to give that sort of wider dissemination. Um, next one, City Fight. So this is again, this is back to the issue is about situational awareness. So I mentioned earlier on that, that City Fight is, is a fascinating double blind game. Uh, but as written, it's just incredibly complex, um, particularly if you're trying to play it at about company scale. Um, so again, for this year's Virtual Cow, I decided, well, okay, let, let, let's play this and let's play it online. Um, so I, I managed to reduce the rules for about two sides of A4. Um, and in fact, I'm probably going to reduce them even further because, you know, to me, the absolute core of the game is this mechanism about trying to identify the enemy, um, find out where they are and then respond to them. Um, and you don't really need a details or combat model uh, to follow through from that. Um, as you'll see, I've, I've changed from hexes to squares. So basically, you've got a mega square in front of us, 4D. Um, that's got nine squares within it. So I would ask to detect somebody in 4D. The enemy would respond about whether or not they've got somebody in, in one of those squares labeled one to nine. Um, and you have to make a roll against the, the, the target number, which is seven for that square. So I've got to roll seven or more on 2D6. Um, in order to be able to detect somebody. Um, but that's not absolutely certain uh, because of the dice modifiers. So the dice that you roll, you apply your modifiers, you tell the enemy what you, the resultant number is, they apply their modifiers, and then they tell you what, what you've seen or not. Um, so that even when you see something or don't see something, it's not absolute information. Um, City Fight itself, you D100. Um, again, I shifted that to 2D6 because uh, it just makes it a lot more playable by a lot more people. Um, and as the, the setup that I had to run the game, uh, basically I put duplicate copies on Google Slides. So blue team had access to one Google Slide with copy of the map and their counters. Red team had access to a different map, also the same map, but in a different instance with their counters. Um, we had a, we used a, a Zoom for an all-informed net uh, to be able to talk to each other. Um, and then I basically just sort of set the tempo for the game and, and coordinated it rather than umpired it. Um, with each side calling out, you know, 4D and enemy responding with, yeah, there's somebody in, in 4D6, um, and then onto the next unit and onto the next unit and onto the next unit. So again, a fairly fast pace um, to, 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 to go through the game, which again is probably matches to the tempo um, of the operations. Um, and now I've got it set up. Quite honestly, it's quite an easy game to set up and, and run for it to, for anybody, unlike setting up all cardboard buildings. Uh, so I'll probably be posting out on uh, Fight Club and elsewhere um some opportunities to play the games as i want to do some further tweaks um 
to it to make it hopefully even more even more realistic quite honestly because there's a couple of, of major issues with it at the moment which were inherent in the original SPI version then brick by bloody brick um is one of the new games i'm working on um so this is effectively the, the company level equivalent of uh, city and sema um you'll notice the terrain is, is identical in this model to uh to um city fight um because in some ways they're operating at about the same level city fight is, is as a company but realistically better at platoon brick by bloody brick is designed to be at, at uh, company level um but you know your spot there we've got things like uavs are out there we've got vehicles and clutter um within the urban space we've got a unit that's exhausted uh we've got the use of blocks again the use of dummy blocks um so really trying to take all of the learnings I, i'm finding in terms of urban warfare at a company level um and trying to represent those in, in a relatively straightforward game um as i haven't played urban operations yet i'm sure there'll be some similarities between what i'm doing and what, what urban operations is doing um my expectation at the moment is i'm going to be at a slightly higher level i think urban operations is more platoon this is going to be more company so there'd be more of the sort of the the, the uh, mixed capabilities coming in um and possibly slightly slightly simpler mechanisms uh and then the final uh game from me on this uh this lot again this is an even earlier planning stage but i'm hoping to get it ready for play during the summer um so this is streets and shadows this is inspired by uh the war in the mega city um it's also got some of the similarities with uh, also inspiration from uh, uh district commander kandahar uh, and that series of games uh, where you're looking at, at breaking down the city into its functional areas. It's a topological game rather than an area game. Uh, but within each of those areas, you've got the ability for basically for a unit to be on the streets. Um, so it's typically green army with tanks and soldiers um, or to be in the shadows, um, in which case it's more likely to be insurgents or, or counter-terror units or, or special forces and the like and militia and the ability for certain units to move between the two um, and, and obviously have their combat uh, better optimized against the activity on the streets or against activity on the shadows um and again I'm, I'm basing this on real terrain um and i thought well let's might as well just do it on london um and so it's quite interesting yesterday I actually was, was or over the weekend rather i was in london walking down the street and actually came across a major substation uh which occupied about two city blocks and you think oh what a target for that uh to us and that may well get added into the matrix uh for this so again that game hopefully uh be up and running uh, by the summer and set at more probably like a, a divisional type level so hopefully that's given you a flavour for, for some of the games that I'm working on, some of the approaches that I'm taking. Um, and I've added to the diagram there some of the thoughts I've got as to sort of where I might go next um, and some of the things that I'd like to do. Uh, so again, Seb, do you want to uh, any uh, other questions before I sort of move into the final bit? I don't see any at the moment. There's a lot of good discussion in the chat, but I don't see any explicit questions, so you can press on. Okay, great. Okay, so I just want to finish off then talking around uh, civilian population. Um, and you, you already got some sort of suggestions uh, from what I've talked about so far uh, about the ways that I've, I've, I've been looking at things. Um, and I think quite core to it is, is this, this USEC model, um, because it really does force you to think about understanding the city in the first place. Uh, you know, what's the city like? Who are the people in it? What are they going to do? What is the infrastructure that you've got to protect? um if that's the way you're, you're going to go or destroy if it's the way you're not going to go um and then sort of into shaping and how do you want to shape the civilian population in terms of moving them to, to areas of safety uh being able to control them being able to police them um and then you've got engage in the fight and, and the issues you're going to have with sort of collateral damage and the like um and then consolidation and how you're sort of going to pick up the pieces um and then assessing the impact so i think it gives a really good framework uh to think about the whole battle uh, and particularly the impact of the battle on the civilian population. And so just as with the, um, the, the ISR model I showed earlier on, again, I'm trying to look at sort of what's that model that, that we need that represents the civilian population that we can then tweak uh, depending on, on what the game is, um, what we're looking at. Um, so, you know, with the civilian population, well, you know, the, we say civilian population, um, but that's going to represent a whole bunch of different people. You know, there's the, the, going to be the people who live there locally, there's the going to be local displaced persons there's going to be refugees possibly um we're obviously going to have have casualties almost certainly what are we going to do with those casualties we're going to have dead you know they're, they're going to represent a health hazard if, if they're left on the streets um what are we going to do in terms of burial uh we've got you know gangs and criminals who are actually just taking advantage of the situation um we've got the perennial question about how many people are going to stay behind 
Um, I think the figure I heard for Avdivka is there were still about a thousand people in Avdivka, despite it having been fought over, um, you know, for, for several months. Um, you know, where where are they? Where are they staying? Where are they going to go? Um, and and all those issues. Um, you've got the, the issue about sympathisers within that community. Um, and you know, if you're the attacker and, and uh, your sympathisers, then how are you going to leverage them to cause disruption uh, and cause chaos? If you're the defender, uh, how are you going to identify them? How are you going to control them? Uh, you then got those linkages in, into into the structures um, of the city, um, and obviously those structures form shelter. Um, you know, one thing is interesting. Luckily, hopefully, UK won't ever be fought over. We had nowhere near as many um, cellars as you tend to get in in the rest of Europe. Um, so you wouldn't get as many people hiding down cellars uh, in the UK uh, as you might do elsewhere. Um, and then you've got all of that 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 infrastructure um, that, that that is then you know potentially at risk from what's happening in the city. One of the things I've been very fortunate um, is I, I said at the beginning I, I'm doing interviews um, and I was actually contacted by the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, by their, their armed services team um, who basically work with the military, both regular militaries and irregular militaries, uh, to try and educate them uh, on, on laws of war, um, but also to try and minimise uh, the impact on civilians and, and minimise civilian harm. Uh, so, for instance, one of the things they're doing at the moment is, is or a couple of things, one is that they're actually producing sort of not quite law of armed conflict documents but 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 guides basically as cartoon documents you know in arabic um in different languages so you can actually disseminate these to a very low level uh within sort of resistance organizations freedom fighter organizations even you know potentially terrorist organizations and guerrilla organizations so to try and make sure that everybody is educated um about what needs to be achieved and what should be done um the second thing they're doing is actually with with sort of the more de um the, sort of the, the more established militaries if you like is working with uh, UAV pilots and UAV crews and, and image interpreters so as to teach them, you know, what a pumping station looks like, what a power substation looks like, so that when they're looking at that imagery and they're trying to work out, you know, where they're going to prosecute an attack, they're better, more aware of what the potential effects are of that attack. And, and the term they used is reverberating effects rather than, than collateral damage. And the reason for that is that, you know, collateral tends to just suggest that, well, if you do X, you might also do Y. Whereas reverberating is there to suggest, well, actually, if you do one thing, it could have an almighty impact, you know, on the multiple other things. So if you accidentally, you know, destroy an electricity substation, um, you know, that is going to impact the pumped water supply, pumped sewage. Um, it's going to impact people's ability to run fridges and freezers. Um, it's going to impact medical care. It's going to impact communications. Um, you know, if you're damaging sewage and water supply, well, actually, that's going to cause more people to become displaced persons. Um, it's going to create more casualties. That's going to put more of a load on the hospital that's already stretched. Um, all those displaced persons around may well sort of reduce your own combat power, create more civil affairs issues. One of the things that they are very big on is this issue about loss of livelihood. Um, and it's not just the impact on, that it's having on, on you now, but it's the impact it's going to have, you know, basically once the fighting stops. Uh, so, you know, if that that stray shell has blown up your shop and that shop was your entire livelihood, you know, had all your life savings in it, all your stock in it, and, and it provided food for you and the rest of the family. Uh, well, actually, you know, you might have survived without damage, but you've lost your livelihood. And how are you going to recover from that? And that loss of livelihood could well be the things that generates more unrest in the city, which, again, more, creates more civilian affairs issues and more uh, reduces combat power. So I think this model of this idea of reverberating effects is an absolutely vital one um, in order to sort of better understand and, and to try and model uh, what happens, particularly at a higher level uh, when we're doing some sort of urban war game. And so, so in terms of looking at that sort of how the civilian population is represented um, in different games, I'm sort of trying to sort of work up a typology um, and sort of my initial thoughts of that shown here. Um, so at one level, you've got it where, where basically civilian population is a non-player uh, representation. It's a non-player character within the game. Um, so at the most basic, it's a passive non-player character. So it's a game like City of Confusion. You turn over a counter in a, an area. It says it's a, a civilian. That's going to have an impact on you whilst you're in that square. As soon as you moved away from that square, it ceases to have an impact. Um, so it's a very passive uh, representation of the civilian population. A slightly more active version of that is what I've got in City in SEMA which is where if you do end up creating a, a, a group of civilian refugees, those refugees stay on the board. They try and get off the board. They try and get to somewhere in, that's safe. All the time they're on the board, they're obviously they're, they're, they're a potential issue that you've got or, or the enemy's got to deal with. Um, so they're active in the game, uh, even if they're still a non-player character. 
Um, if you look particularly at maybe a more professional game, uh, then you may still have have sort of non-player characters, but they may all be represented by the umpire. Um, and one of the things we, I've talked about with ICRC is, is the potential for actually having some sort of a white cell guide. Certainly in the UK, white cell represents the civilians. I think it's different in America, where it tends to represent the, the exercise control. Um, but the idea about actually having providing guidelines to 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 come to countries if they are running uh, some sort of a, a civilian population cell, in actually just what what are realistic behaviours uh, for those people um, and how do you represent those within the war game? Uh, the next level is is where you actually are representing them as a player. Um, so you know what in that case you need to know you know what are their aims, what are the actions available to them, just as you would do with any other player in the game. Um, and, you know, we certainly see examples of that in, in Riot Games, and I've included Riot Games uh, on my, my database uh, because obviously there's some useful learnings out of those. Uh, you often see them in, in humanitarian games. Um, they're a fairly easy uh, thing to represent in a Matrix game is to have a player who's representing uh, the civilian population. Um, one of the ideas that's always intrigued me is this idea of an orthogonal game, uh, which is where you've got red and blue sort of fighting their war game uh, against each other in, in a conventional way. Uh, but then you've got other players who are basically playing the civilian population. And if you like, they're always playing a different sort of game uh, because they're sort of trying to survive. They're trying to get to safety. Um, and almost that they're playing their game. The, the, the army's playing the, 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 the green army type game. Um, but those touch points are obviously going to still occur uh, where you've got to deal with what's happening and, and what the other the, the civilian, civilian players are trying to achieve. And then the final level of the typology is, is one where it's about focus or representation. Um, and you know, the civilians are the focus of the game. Uh, this war of mine is obviously the one that, that most people know uh, in terms of representing, you know, what it is you do to survive. And, and these games are verging almost on, on black games um, in terms of, of, of what they're representing, how they're playing. There's a couple of online games primarily designed for mobile. Uh, so Bury Me, My Love, uh, which I think is around uh, Syria and Syri Syrian refugees, and Lila that's around uh, Gaza uh, re refugees from one of the previous conflicts. Um, but both games in which you, 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 you are representing or you are playing the role of the civilian population and just trying to survive uh, within the battle that's taking place. So there's sort of some of my initial thoughts and, and then, you know, back to one of the earlier questions about, you know, one of the, the, one of the hard things to represent, I think, trying to represent the civilian population accurately or, or realistically or validly um, is, is probably one of the toughest ones. And I said I'd say a few things about um, sort of, you know, what the, the current state of play is in terms of, of what we're seeing in Gaza and Ukraine. Um, and again, these are very high level sort of, 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 of sort of gut feels, if you like, at the moment. Um, you know, in, in terms of things like UAVs, tank, roller tanks, use of direct HG, precision fires, subterranean. I, I think, you know, there are obviously a lot of lessons that we are learning there, UAVs in particular. Um, the fact that tanks have been used very differently, certainly in the early days of the Gaza conflict, to, the, to what we would expect um, in terms of, of discussions around combined arms. Um, subterranean, obviously, in Gaza, the, the IDF has obviously been obsessed around the, the tunnels and, and trying to identify those tunnels uh, and destroy those tunnels. So I think there's a lot of learnings, obviously, across the piece in terms of those characteristics of urban warfare uh, that have kind of come out from those two battles. I mean, potentially more interesting, I think, is, is first of all, particularly in the Ukraine, um, is this issue about the fact we've got one front that's been very urban um, in terms of, of Avdivka and Bakhmut um, and, you know, one front that's been very rural in terms of the southern front. Um, yes, you've had fighting over villages. Obviously, partly that's dictated by the terrain and, and where the cities are. Um, but we do appear to have seen, certainly with, with Avdivka and Bakhmut, a real sort of obsession um, around, you know, the taking of those cities that goes right back to Stalingrad uh, and, and to Sheng as well. Um, and so understanding what it is that drives, you know, the military planners, the military operations down that that urban route as against the rural route, um, I think is going to be a key thing and how we represent that. And obviously at a higher level game when you're, you're looking at the different options and giving players both those options to, to, to execute. Um, and also I think that ties into one of the papers I've done as a working paper that's on the website, and I'll try and do as a formal paper. Um, is around uh, urban battles that weren't. Um, and looking at those situations, um, Kuwait is probably one example, the fall of, of, of uh, Kabul is probably another example, where people thought there was going to be a big urban battle, uh, but it didn't happen uh, because, you know, one side or the other, you know, just, or the, typically the attacker just played a game that was completely different to what was maybe expected by the defender uh, and by the media. Um, and so I think that that's sort of part and parcel of this discussion. Um, and it may be that actually with things like Bakhmut and, and Avdivka, 
there's a separate paper there about urban battles that shouldn't have been. Um, and Stalingrad probably also falls into that category um, and understanding what it is that creates that fixation. And, and then sort of slightly related to that, I think there's this, this thing that I've called the urban calculus, um, which again, I think sort of goes back to answering some of the earlier, earlier questions around, and around sort of morale and things like that. Um, you know, if you look at, at, at one particular side, you know, they've got fires, they've got infantry, they've got tanks. Obviously, they've got a preference to use fires and tanks because that's going to minimise their own casualties. The minute they start using infantry, you know, as we've seen with the IDF, uh, then their own casualties are going to mount up. Uh, that might sap national will. Um, it might well sap governmental will. Uh, but the problem with fires and tanks is they're the things that are going to cause the majority of civilian casualties. They're the things that are going to cause that reverberating damage. Um, and as I mentioned on the earlier slide, that reverberating damage can turn into loss of livelihood. Um, you know, what is the impact of that in terms of, of national opinion and national will? You know, I think what we've seen in both Gaza and in, in Ukraine is that national will is actually been very solid, uh, typically in terms of, of, of living with the impacts um, of, 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 of the damage or to the civilian infrastructure uh, and the loss of civilian casualties. Uh, but both of those will also be the thing that, that, that potentially is the most visible to international opinion. And one would expect that international opinion to then have some lever to play against government will. Um, but, you know, certainly what we've, we've seen, uh, you know, probably on both the Israeli side and, and on the Russian side, is that that linkage hasn't been there to the extent to which it was expected. And we had a good discussion around we are coming Gaza and, and what sort of linkage should be in that particular game uh, between the, the, the sort of the international opinion and, and government will. So I think looking at, at sort of how that calculus plays out um, in different sort of urban situations, uh, or, or the different urban situations it creates even, um, is something that's, that's occupying me at the moment. And, and I think actually, you know, basically from those eight hexes, you know, that's beginning to give me a sense of, of the sort of game, very high level game, uh, that it might be interesting to create uh, in order to sort of further study this. And, and just to finish off and just to, 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 to slightly lighten the mood a bit, um, you know, as you gathered from the earlier slides, you know, I've done a lot of work in virtual reality. Um, obviously, we've now got mixed reality. One of the big issues with urban environment, with urban war games, is how do you represent the urban space? Um, and mixed reality potentially gives us the answer to that. Um, so here we've got pictures taken in the room behind me uh, with my Oculus Quest virtual reality headset on. Uh, you'll recognise the layout from from the couple of games I've already showed you. Um, and so it's quite easy to have a flat map on the on the table and actually replace that the the two D buildings with three D buildings. And I can just reach in and I can either do it with the virtual counters or physical counters. Um, I can play that game with somebody in a totally different space or with somebody in the same the same space. Uh, I can leave cards and QRSs just hanging in the air. I don't need the table space to play the game. Uh, so if I'm playing something like Literal Commander, then I've got loads of space to put all the, the PACs up uh, around the room as I'm playing the game. Um, and then the picture on the top right there, uh, that's an application called World with three O's, uh, which has you know wonderful 3D res cities uh, that I can just res straight into my war games room. Um, I haven't quite worked out how I can then play a war game over that, but that that uh, is something that's going to come. Um, and the bottom right, just to show you can do this in, in the physical world and the outdoor world as well, that's actually down my local park uh, with my mixed reality headset on and just parking a T-72 on the, on the lawn. The weird thing is now every time I walk past that part of the park, I expect to see a T-72 there, uh, but luckily it isn't. So uh, a lot there, um, but more than happy to... Uh, deal with any questions uh, either now or later, you can get hold of me easily on email uh, and on Twitter at Urban Wargamer. And as I said, all the information about those games, actually downloadable copies of some of them and in due course downloadable copies of all of them uh, will be up on the wiki. And so with that, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And Sebastian, back over to you. Hey, David, great presentation. Um, so to jump into the questions, the first question I have is any ideas about the optimal approach for military planners about to conduct uh, urban operations? Sorry, the optimum? Uh, optimal approach for military planners to think about or conduct urban operations. Um, I, I, I think it is, to me that it is that USEC model, um, which is about understanding exactly what it is you're getting into understanding particularly you know what the nature of that urban environment is uh what the nature of the civilian population is um i think increasingly it's about trying to make sure you're doing it ahead of time which is back to that that you know urban battles that weren't um you know i know you know we would traditionally love to avoid fighting in the cities well are there ways that you can avoid that um and that's going to come out of things like those flow models and the like but i think you know possibly again this is where ukraine and, and gaza has said well actually maybe that's that's a false model uh, when it comes down to it. 
um, with the realities of the, the, the way that fighting works. But I think it is taking that 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 very broad sort of USEC approach, doing a lot of, of the early work um, in order to understand the city and to be able to shape the city. Um, and then in terms of, of what sort of tactics you then employ in the city, you know, that's one of the things that I'm going to be interested in with the games I create about, you know, whether you look at these sort of, the sort of steamroller type approaches, the leapfrogging approaches, the nodal approaches, is the ability to actually then try and war games those, those, those different sorts of urban doctrine uh, to see which applies best uh, to the sort of city you're after. I think the challenge is, is how do we create an urban war game which is short and sharp and fast enough that you can actually use it within a military planning situation. Um, and you'll have noticed from that, that slide about what war games I'm going to want to do next. You know, one of the ones I'd like to look at is how do you do a co-op war game for urban? Um, you know, bearing in mind you might only have 20 minutes to do the co-op war game. Um, and, and how do you provide the right sort of tools to let people do that, even if it's at a very, very high level? So the next question uh, asks is, in regard to some mechanics like line of sight, um, are most rules too generic for urban warfare? Yeah, I, I, I mean, m m most rules, it, it's, you know, if there's an obstacle there that's a tree hex, um, then, you know, that blocks line of sight and that's it. Um, the uh, city fight, when you get into the advanced rules, that really has detailed equations, basically, you know, for, for the levels of, of obstruction and where you are. Um, I think you can abstract it a little bit simpler than that. Um, I, I think a fairly good ruling is, is that the difference in height uh, gives you between you and the obstruction um, gives you the the, the, the uh, and, uh, is it minus the distance to the obstruction gives you the amount of sort of, of, of hidden and covered behind that. So I think there are some quite easy sort of heuristics you can develop. And again, this is the advantage of doing it on something like 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 a, a nice gridded surface um, in order to work out line of sight. I think it becomes less of an issue potentially when you're looking at an area-based game because typically those areas are somewhat bigger uh, and line of sight is less is less of a concern. Um, but yes, I most rural games the, the the treatment is not sufficiently complex to to be able to support an urban urban battle. So this is a question for myself, um, and because I always tell my students, you always have to build a mental. Uh, a schema, a mental model of how something works before you can start designing a game. And I saw some of it in your uh, slide before where you're looking a couple slides back where you had like urban warfare fires, um, national will, and you had like the little hexagons connecting to each other. Um, do you have more, uh, more of an in-depth um, representation or graphic or schema of how urban warfare generally works and how we should endeavor to better represent that? Um, I have been trying to do one, uh, but reality is it's just always been far too complex. Um, so what I'm doing at the moment is, is I'm looking at, me, if you like, particular subsystems, for want of a better word. Uh, so I showed that one around civilian population. I showed the one at the beginning around ISR. Um, so I think that's probably a more realistic way to do it, which is try and work out in a high level model what the, what the different subsystems are uh, and then represent each of the subsystems as its own subsidiary model. Um, yeah, I've tried to get it all onto the same the same chart, but it's, it it just becomes a bird's nest. I'll follow I'll follow up with you offline and try to discuss more about those subsystems because I also yeah. agree like it's too much for everything. But I think um, snapshots into subsystems are is the way to go. Yeah. Um, anyway, so next to the audience question is um, someone from the Irish Army Joint Command uh, and Staff College, I believe. Um, has asked, have you found any games suitable for peace support operations? Um, there are a few on the database. Um, so I think Rock, Paper, Scissors, I think has got one. Um, I think Shaw Brown Train has done one, it may even be the same game. Um, so there are some games that are on there, um, but there, there are there maybe it's at most maybe half a dozen uh, to a dozen games. Have a look on the database. As I say, it's, it's linkable off that URL. Uh, you can do a filter, I think, by humanitarian um, or by and, and similar sorts of searches uh, to, to identify those games. Um, and certainly it's an area I, you know, I want to look at. Um, one of the things I'm looking at doing is, is probably a game around uh, services protected evacuation, uh, which is probably as close as I'd get to doing that. Uh, but yeah, go and have a look at the database and see what's on there. So as I wait for any final questions, uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for uh, spending your evening, I believe, in the UK. Uh, uh, our early, afternoon, early evening, yeah. Uh, our uh, afternoon here on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, sharing this, I learned a lot. Uh, I think you 
provide a great overview of urban warfare and wargaming in general. Um, and I know you are attending one of uh, the webinars for one of my other students as for my class as they're designing urban war game of their own. Um, and I'm sure they'll benefit greatly from your expertise. Um, so I don't see any other questions so far, but uh, for any of those who have burning questions later, you can reach out to David uh, directly, his email and Twitter is on the slide. And uh, David, could you send me your slides so we can post them up as well uh, for those who may be interested? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed it.